Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our exclusive Global Leading Voices webinar campaign. We are delighted to have you join us here today. Please be informed that if you have any questions during the presentation, you may type them into the question box in your control panel. The presenter will answer your questions at the end of the presentation accordingly. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to our presenter, who will begin shortly. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good day. Thank you for coming to attend the, uh, the webinar that we're going to talk about today, the significance of risk management in business continuity today. Um, I'm Gary Sikic, a principal with a company called Logical Management Systems Corp, uh, located near Chicago, Illinois. A uh, bit of background on me, <clears throat> I've been in this arena of business continuity risk management and uh, crisis management consulting for a number of years. Uh, have a lot of expertise in dealing with companies and organizations that have high issue resolutions with regards to business continuity, crisis management, uh, disaster recovery, et cetera. And in that time frame uh, that I've been working, I have developed a, a fairly good repertoire, uh, four books that I've written, one of which has been translated to Spanish, the uh, uh, 410 articles that maybe even more before before the uh, end of this month. Um, my latest book was on protecting your business in a pandemic, which was written with a focus on business as it would operate in a pandemic situation. And I think it's a good it's kind of a segue into looking at business content of the overlaps that I see. So what we'll do, because we've got close to 100 questions that the attendees have sent in, is to try to focus on some aspects of explaining the process of business continuity and risk management, as well as looking at how they can integrate as a uh, kind of an integrated, unified effort, if you will. So let me talk about a definition, if you will, of business continuity. Now, there are definitions of business continuity in ISO 22301 and in other areas, uh, such as the NFPA uh, 1600. I look at business continuity in this way, and you have to begin to start to look at it, I think, in a broad, broad sense. So business continuity is all the initiatives taken to assure the survival, growth, and resilience of the enterprise. Uh, as it says here on the slide, it means continuation of the business. It does not mean continuation of the business only if there is a tornado, flood, hurricane, terrorist attack, or IT problem. So we need to be able to kind of build a comprehensive understanding of looking at continuity of operations, how do we continue our operations regardless of the nature of the problem? So are there some common threads that we begin to look at in this area? And by the way, m my definition, if you notice on the, again on the slide on the screen, uh, I made that in 2002. So that's 15 years, 16 years ago almost. Um, when we begin to start to think, rethink continuity and what does it mean? Let me switch to the definition of risk and enterprise risk management. Uh, this is from the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations for the, uh, the Treadway Commission. And risk definition there was the possibility that events will occur and affect the achievement of strategy and business objectives. Well, go back to my business continuity definition. Your focus in continuity and risk management has to be related to the strategy and business objectives of the organization. If they're not related to those areas of strategy and business objectives, how can you have effective plans and risk management programs to achieve those goals and objectives? So it's important for us to understand that business continuity and risk management are supportive of the corporate or enterprise strategy and business objectives. And that means whether or not it's a private sector entity or a government entity, strategy and objectives are critical to achieving for the organization. You have to have plans and risk management program in place that help you 
identify the threats and identify ways to continue the business operation. So those two are very critical in their basis. So some facts to consider. This is where I think we have a challenge for people in risk management and business continuity. If you look at the, the, some factors here on the slide, risk is not static, it's fluid. So what do I mean by that? I mean that every time you identify a risk, you have essentially altered that risk in some way, shape, or form. Because by identifying it, you change it. And as you change it, you start to have to look at how can I protect against the risk real, being realized? If it's negative, if it's positive, uh, what do I do to capitalize on it? So risk is fluid. Risk is not static. Uh, risk probes for weaknesses to exploit. Risk can only be temporarily mitigated. Now, if we think about that statement, people have a tendency to get a little bit concerned. What do you mean it's temporarily mitigated? It means that over time, the risk changes and it changes into a different form. And you, what you've done to mitigate it is suddenly no longer as effective. Over time, risk mitigation degrades. So whatever you put into place to protect against the risk realization, that over time will degrade. You have to continually look at risk being a factor that you, that you need to do what I call active analysis. If you think about that, if we think about that in the context of business continuity, all these things apply. Business is not static, it's fluid. Risk as it says here, probes for weaknesses is to exploit. Business continuity protects against weaknesses. Business continuity and risk are, are joined in that whatever we look at from a business impact assessment standpoint, et cetera, those are only temporarily uh, mitigated. So let's take those factors into consideration and look at some perspectives. I'll go through this briefly. This was a... Uh, CEB Gartner did a study, and it's a uh, fairly lengthy one, but I highlight here some, some things I thought were interesting. When we look at strategic, operational, legal, compliance, and financial reporting risks, they're broken down here. This is a, a look at the likelihood of occurrence and how much time executives spend on them. So you have, with strategic business risks, 86% chance that it's going to happen but they only spend 6% of their time looking at it. Operational risk, 9% that you'll have a risk realized, but 42% of our time is spent looking at it. You can see the dichotomy, risk and financial, et cetera. The, the fact is that we have low probability financial reporting risk, 2%, yet we spent 39% of our time addressing those issues from either a regulatory standpoint or from a per reporting standpoint. So there, there is a bit of a disjoint where we have our greatest risk, we spend the least amount of times. And that's where when we start to look at the strategic aspect, business continuity has to come into play. So when we look at this, have to look at kind of, in, if you will, a humorous perspective uh, of all a chart with a bunch of things on it. And the, the, the comment is, I'll pause a moment so you can let this information sink in, sink in. Well, with regards to the information we've provided thus far, I'll pause a moment, let it sink in. Now I'll turn to answering some of your questions. As I mentioned, we had a huge amount of response with regards to questions. So well over uh, 100 questions that, that came in. Uh, let me talk about these. I won't talk about them in order. I'll highlight some and we'll look at some of the important aspects here uh, and realize that there's there are a lot of questions that were very similar in context. So I'll, I'll work you through a few different slides after I look at some of the questions. First question, how often and when should I conduct risk assessment for my business continuity in today's scenario? I would tell you how often, every day, every minute, you need to begin to start to think differently about risk assessment. Identifying risks causes them to change. Identifying business impacts causes them to change. You need to constantly do what I call active analysis. And if you look at, and you'll find my contact information at the end of this presentation, 
there are several articles I've written on active analysis on uh, thinking like a commodities trader that look at how we need to begin to rethink the aspects of risk assessment, business impact assessment, etc. cetera. Uh, second question here, <clears throat> isn't the implementation of ISO 22301 not enough to cover for risk management and business continuity? I would say that that is a challenging uh, aspect because ISO 22301 and some of the other uh, standards, if you will, that are out there address only certain aspects of business continuity and risk management. Think about ISO 22301 and, and look at uh, what, the enterprise risk management standard. They, they all have a tendency to be narrowly focused in some respects. Now, that's not to say that they're not good. I think they're a great basis. But when you begin to look at only systems aspects and not business aspects, you suddenly start to see a whole world of risk that you're missing. So think about business and business aspects and begin to start to look at issues uh, to ensure that risk management actions are effective. Can we master all the risks? Uh, two questions, if you will, in that context. First is, what's criteria to ensure that risk management actions are effective? I've got a slide that I'll show you that just kind of visualizes that. Understanding that whatever you've done to identify the risk and mitigate against that risk, what I'll call risk buffering, is going to be something that you have to monitor constantly with an active analysis process to continually make sure that the risk is not altered in such a way that it's going to affect you. Can we master all the risks? Do you know all the risks is what I would ask you because you obviously are asking a question that cannot be answered in, in the context of, of, so we've got what, known knowns, things that we identify, facts. We've got things that we speculate on, known unknowns, if you will. We have a known unknown with something that, that we identify, but we don't, don't know what the unknown unknowns, which until we identify them, we don't, we don't know anything about the risks on, in those areas. So how can I say that we can cover all the risks or master all the risks when we don't know all the risks. Think about the issue of a pandemic, and we're looking at uh, this year's flu season becoming quite broad and having a lot of impact. I, the flu shot is 30% effective. So that means that 70% is not as effective. So why get a flu shot? Well, obviously, you want to protect against something, but you don't know all the risks. We don't know what virus will emerge that will create a pandemic, for instance. We don't know what kind of risks our organizations face. So when we look at these things, we looked at really kind of building a broader understanding. Um, you skip to how the enterprise security risk management and business continuity can be integrated. I think this is a kind of a critical issue. These two need to work hand in hand in order to be effective. And again, I'll focus on the, the aspect of achieving the goals and objectives of the organization. Those two areas, risk management and business continuity, have to be able to support the achievement of goals and objectives regardless of the situation of discontinuity that an organization might find itself in. Uh, how can uh, how a business continuity process can be set up within a small company? I think it's, it's fairly uh, the same as for a big company. There are three levels that I look at with business continuity and with risk management. You have a strategic level, an operational level, and what I'll call a tactical level. Tactical level is kind of the day-to-day -day, um, issues that I face that generally don't get to be big problems and are resolved fairly easily, uh, but should be tracked and understood. When we look at those, there are some common functions that transcend those three levels. Someone's got to be in charge. 
management function, if you will. Someone has to be uh, looking at planning, short-term, long-term, intermediate-term. Someone has to be looking at logistics. Someone has to look at finance. Someone has to look at administration of external and start to realize how little control you have of it and how much impact it potentially has for your operation. Well, think about this in this in this term. When I wrote the book on pandemic planning, I talked with the uh, chairman of the Chicago Board of Trade to have him write the introduction. Initially, he was reluctant, but changed his mind very quickly when I pointed out a few things and then gave him an article I'd written on the economic impacts. And he called me to his office and said, we're gonna have a major problem with this pandemic thing. And I thought, yeah, you're not gonna have people in the trading pits, you're gonna have to do electronic, but you may not be able to do that because the government may take all those electronic uh, telecommunications for national security purposes. So no bigger problem. He said, it, it, if you're telling me that 40% of the people are going to get sick, he said, there's only 80,000 agricultural inspectors. And that means that the people who are trading commodities, agricultural products, pork, beef, etc., will not take a risk if the product is not certified. And if you have half of the people that do the certification out because they're sick, you don't have a certification. So they won't take the risk of getting a product that is not acceptable. Suddenly we see a change in how the business model works. Um, I wanna stay in business, business continuity. My risk is that I would trade pork bellies or corn or wheat, whatever the product is, and find out it's not USDA certified, so therefore nobody wants to buy it because they don't know whether or not it's a good product. Now I have, now I have a situation where my business is impacted and I'm stuck with this. So we see these things that are, are touching on a lot of our different areas. How we relate financial risk captured in ERM to business continuity risk. They are one and the same. Business continuity risks and financial risks should be part of an integrated process. Uh, what's the biggest risk in business continuity today? This, this, the simple answer to this question is staying with a business model too long to deal with the changes and disruption in the business marketplace in today's day and age. Let me go on to some other questions. Uh, how do you define and ensure business continuity planning related to a strategic change of circumstances or reputational risk? Now, there are several questions that look at reputational risk and look at these areas. You need to have comprehensive programs that deal with broader based issues. So business continuity should have a link to crisis management, crisis communications, risk management, uh, emergency response. So all those areas build a plan, what I call an all hazards plan, that can, can, can take all those areas and merge them so that you don't act in a gosh, we have a situation, what plan should we activate? What happened here? What happened there? Who's doing what? Everybody knows what's going on. I, I wrote an article is called, Is Your Business, Is Your Planning Brittle? And the article looked at the focus on what I'll call siloed planning, which is essentially, we built this plan and we're, we're dealing with it. Security didn't talk to business continuity, it didn't talk to disaster recovery, didn't talk to, didn't talk to, didn't, you can go on and on. And as a result, these plans get implemented in a fragmented way. We need to get away from that aspect. Uh, sample business impact analysis template. I would say that you could look at my article on active analysis and look at what I use as far as a business impact assessment tool develop a system called LMS Carver, C-A-R-V-E-R. -E Carver is based on a military uh, targeting system, but I've adapted it to look at a broader base of business issues. And you begin to start to look at the, car the, the process we go through, and it allows you to look at three levels of uh, impact and risk and, and identifying 
the potential business impact. So you have a strategic level, a operational level, and a tactical level. Those are critical to be merged and integrated. So it begins to start to get us a situation where we start to see a broader base of understanding. So LMS Carver, and again, look for my article on active analysis uh, and my other article on uh, is your business planning, is your planning uh, brittle. Uh, what's the impact of risk management in terms of not having good corporate government and how, governance and how to deal in such a situation? We've got tremendous shift in focus on governance. Uh, so we have governance, risk and compliance. We have, what is it now, GDPR, uh, the, the global data protection. All risk issues that need to be addressed in some way, shape or form that allow us to deal with a broader base of situations. Let me kind of slip down to how do you relate the topic to the banking sector? The banking sector is no more a sector, if you will, than an element of the broader based economy. So everyone's affected by what happens because I make money as a business. Where do I put my money back into the business? And how do I do that? Through the banks. So banks have a responsibility to develop broader based business continuity programs programs that integrate their clients into their processes. Same with the, the, uh, the, the entity, the, 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 the company it needs to look at broader based business continuity. How do I evaluate from a business impact assessment? What happens if I lose a big customer? How does this affect my business? Well, most BIAs don't even think about that as well as risk management. They really don't consider these. So we need to be kind of upping our game, if you will. Uh, do current business continuity standards adequately address the operational dependency organizations have on IT? Uh, I would say that they don't adequately address it. They do tacitly address it. Um, IT is changing. We see a change in how information systems work. Um, to give you a classic example of this, yesterday uh, when we were preparing to do a dry run on this, I had an IT problem. It took me all day to get things kind of squared away so that you're able to see this presentation. Uh, there was a lot of nervousness on both parts, mine and PCB, with can we get this done? And we looked at a bunch of alternatives to doing with it. Fortunately, the tech people that I had working for me on this we're able to deal with this in such a way that we were able to fortunately get the tech issue, I'll put in quotes, solved. I'm not sure yet. Uh, the next two questions, what con should constitute a BIA questionnaire template and in which sequence do you deliver risk analysis and BIA? I think these are combined, can combine, be combined. The BIA questionnaire, I mentioned my LMS Carver and you can find that under the active analysis area. Risk analysis, BIA, should go hand in hand. You should not be doing separate analyses for these two areas. They should be merged because they're one and the same in a lot of respects. What is best, risk assessment before or after business impact assessment? Do them sequentially and combine them into one. You need to understand risk and business impact are, are combined. They're much the same. Uh, the last one here I think is interesting. How should residual risk be effectively managed in an organization? Go back to my aspect of active analysis. Constantly look at the risk and how it's changed and begin to understand that risk management is a element that needs to be looked at differently because risk doesn't stay static. Um, I think these are these are some great questions and unfortunately because of time we don't really have the time to go through everyone in detail. However at the end you'll be able to email B uh, and PECB with specific questions that we'll try to answer. So let me kind of consolidate what I've looked at as far as your questions and how we might want to be, think about risk and business continuity. Okay, so I recognize a risk. I want to move to an altered risk state to protect my organization. Okay, so that's the blue arrow, the dark blue arrow on the linear. Straight line, I want to move from recognized risk to altered risk. 
when I go to execute against that risk, I want to understand that there are some things that are positive and negative. I can take an action. It could be the right action. Now I'm protected or I've buffered the risk. I can take an action, could be a wrong action. Now I've got greater risk. I can do nothing, take no action, and that might be the right thing to do, or it could be the wrong thing to do. So we, we have positive and negative consequences, but again, focusing on this issue, I want to move to an altered risk state that buffers my organization from the potential impact. Now on the bottom of this screen, you see that there are the terms transparent vulnerabilities, outliers, variables, linear versus nonlinear thinking, and then distorted maps of real risks. There uh, are several things I've written on transparent vulnerabilities. One of the aspects that I'll, I'll bring to light, I mentioned the Board of Trade and sitting with the chairman of the board talking about agricultural inspectors. No one had thought about this. It's a transparent vulnerability. It's something we don't think about because we're so used to dealing with that we don't see it as a risk. But what happens if those people got sick and suddenly the food chain would stop? So recognize this is a, it looks complex, but the slide is fairly simple. You want to move from risk to altered risk. You want to do some things and then you want to check. The action, no action, wrong action, right action, this execution against risk is something you constantly want to monitor. So my action, I might find it's the wrong actions and I need to really quickly alter that so that I could make it the right action to get to the altered risk state. Very critical that we understand this is not a linear process. This is not something that we do once and and don't have to worry about. This is something we constantly have to monitor and work with. So I'll talk about a, an approach that I take, and this is related, again, to business continuity if we look at how this structure works. So we talk about risk parity. This is an approach that focuses on the allocation of assets to risk, usually defined by exposure velocity and volatility, rather than the allocation of assets to the risk. Okay, so it's it's a matter of beginning to understand that I'll allocate assets based on exposure volatility and uh, and velocity, versus here's a risk. I'll put these assets here and not think about it. The approach asserts that when an asset allocations are adjusted, leveraged or deleveraged, right or wrong actions, this to the same risk level, risk parity is achieved. So what we create is a buffering of risk, if you will. I have done what I need to do to buffer against the risk being realized. In the same vein, with business continuity, it all focuses on reaching the goals and objectives of the organization that we need be flexible with. We need to be, as they say today, resilient. Um, so we, we really need to understand these things. And I'll look at now what I consider the seven identified need or seven identified needs. There are probably many, many more. But we can look at this in the context of the questions you've asked. So techniques for identifying permanent versus cyclical changes in the external operating environment. Critical for us to understand what's going on external to our organization. In the broadest sense, uh, they just reported this morning a earthquake of a 7.9 magnitude off the coast of Alaska that potentially put out tsunami warnings uh, throughout the entire Pacific region. So now how do we deal with this if we literally don't know because we didn't feel the earth shake and suddenly we're now faced with a situation that is potentially disruptive to us? Uh, techniques for spotting and buffering risks so that the organization has the ability to leverage risk management activities for competitive advantage. This deals with, again, business continuity, continuing the business despite the situations or the disruption that you're faced, which we do every day. Think about transportation, think about logistics. A computer chip that goes into a computer travels to the Pacific Ocean at least three times before it's put into the computer, which may be, again, 
built in California, built in Arizona, built in South America, built in Ireland, built in uh, Southeast Asia, and transported worldwide. So tremendous amount of, of shipping that goes on. I'll think about what's going on in the shipping industry. Uh, and I'll begin to look at that aspect. Shipping industry is, is changing because of economics. They want to make themselves profitable or more profitable. So they're building bigger and bigger ships, carrying more and more containers. Think about the containers that are on these ships. Suddenly we have smaller, we had smaller ships with containers moving all over the place. Now we have bigger and bigger ships containing more and more containers moving all over the place. Yet the risk is probably higher for a significant loss because of the concentration of the containers on a huge ship. And by the way, there's, there's a great website you can go to. It's called G Captain, uh, and it is a uh, kind of a newsletter blog type uh, thing that, that will provide you a tremendous amount of information on the shipping industry and things that we just don't hear about in the news, like uh, ships that sink, that ships that run aground, uh, oil rigs that uh, blow up, uh, pipelines that have problems, a whole magnitude of, of information that can apply to your business continuity aspects and risk management. I'll give you a, a simple example. This is kind of an interesting one. An article that was written a, a while back that talked about the uh, pipeline, the North Sea pipeline that the, the Brits had uh, built from the North Sea oil fields to supply oil to their refineries in Scotland, etc. They were doing some normal maintenance on the pipeline when they suddenly discover that right adjacent to the pipeline is a World War I or World War II sea mine. That's something that could explode and cause disruption. My question was, where was that at when, when they did the business impact analysis or the risk assessment? Who didn't think about that? Well, obviously, you don't think about those things because they're not common. Yet here, this potentially, sh this actually sh shut down the pipeline until they removed the mine and, and were able to, to destroy it. In the same vein, in Britain, they find, as in Germany and other places, uh, they continually dredge up old World War I, World War II bombs that are still. So when you do a business impact assessment, you ever look at these issues? When you look at risk management, do you ever look at these issues? Well, no, we don't think about them because they're not, they're directly in front of us things that we look at. So we need to change and have techniques for spotting and buffering risk. My perspective on active analysis, if you will. Uh, tools for stimulating the creation of options, particularly where change is occurring rapidly and the scope of risk management action is shifting. This applies to business continuity as well. You've got to be extremely flexible. You've got to be able to change rapidly to deal with situations that are suddenly thrust upon you. So think about business continuity and risk management as working hand in hand to be very flexible and very responsive. Everybody talks about the resilient in enterprise. You need to be flexible and responsive in order to achieve some level of resilience. Now, can you do 100%? No, you're never going to have it 100%. But having it there and being able to deal with it rapidly is one of the critical aspects. Uh, tools for stimulating the understanding of what I'll call opaque risk forces that are truly dynamic with multiple orders of consequence uh, effects. There's a lot of opacity in the world today. You know, opacity basically is, is simply, we don't see things because they are not clear. They're a risk that is out there that we just don't see as being clear. Think about the changes in terms of, of risk and business continuity over the years. If you were a carbon paper manufacturer, was the computer a risk or a threat? Did it have an impact on your business? No, not directly. It affected the people who built typewriters, but suddenly you found that 
carbon paper manufacturers were out of business because of a cascading risk that they had not looked at or a cascading business impact that they hadn't looked at because they said we're not in competition with the computers we're pr producing carbon paper so we start to look at needing this tool for stimulating the understanding of what I call opacity and you begin to look at how do we deal with these opaque forces what do we do with there's a change in our business environment uh, proven tools for improving strategy risk management business continuity and competitive intelligence processes now this is an interesting area because I haven't talked about competitive intelligence yet but if you take risk management, business continuity, and competitive intelligence and combine them, you begin to start to look at integrating more and more with the strategic thought process of senior executives. This is a critical area because we need to understand how they think. A colleague who was doing a webinar one time uh, mentioned this, and I thought it was kind of classic in this regard. His comment was very simple, St uh, senior management will take whatever risks they have to in order to achieve their goals and objectives. So when you begin to think about this area, you start to see a tremendous disjoint between risk management as it's offered and business continuity as it's offered via the ISO standards, via the regulatory standards, et cetera, and management, senior management's thinking, hey, I'm going to take whatever risk I have to take in order to achieve my goals and objectives because my bonus depends on this. So understand this disjoint and understand the need to communicate effectively in order to achieve the strategies, goals, and objectives of the organization while buffering against the discontinuity that could result. Uh, techniques for generating and harnessing insights from big data about risk, customers, competitors, etc. Big data is a huge issue. We now have within big data what they call data lakes, which is essentially raw data that's input and that can be drawn out and manipulated. So we have a challenge there finding out, is it the raw data or is it the altered raw data? And how does this affect things? Big data is a huge area. It is one that will consume a lot of organizations in terms of time, et cetera. And it's important that we begin to understand and start to look at the risks and how do we do business continuity in these areas. Notice I mentioned uh, competitors, customers, and suppliers, critical to your business continuity and risk management areas. You're only as good as those three are integrated within your context of analysis. Techniques for identifying and focusing top team, your senior management, attention on new or poorly understood risks before it's too late and the risks materialize. Again, I'll go back to my discussion sitting with the, the chairman of the board of Chicago Board of Trade and the president of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and talking with them about pandemic and talking with them about the changes and then suddenly them realizing that what they thought they were going to be able to do will just add more electronic trading was potentially a risky option because the government might take all that electronic communications media and use it for national security which meant that they had to understand where they were in the pecking order of getting assets to deal with the continuation of their business. So very critical for us to understand. Um, kind of conclude this and, and leave us a little bit of time for some more questions. I found this in a PECB publication. I find it to be quite fascinating. Uh, a slide that said, when things go wrong, you must have a business continuity plan in place. Now, this is this is one of these slides that I think people are like. Ooh, oh, yeah, we need this. It says 50% of businesses go after go out of business after a major disruption. Having researched this and having a colleague who passed away a few years ago research this, we never could find out where that statistic came from. The fact of the matter is that businesses go out of business fairly rapidly, regardless of whether they have a business disruption or not. 
Many businesses go out of business because they don't have any customers. Many businesses go out of business because, and you can fill in the blank as far as what potential issues drove them out of business. Go to, go back to my, my perspective on the carbon paper manufacturer. They're running hap, ha, happy and making carbon paper and enjoying life. Suddenly the computer dis, dislodges them and they find out they don't have any customers anymore. What happened? Now, they were blindsided. It was not a major disruption. Their business didn't burn down. There was no natural disaster, no, no technology. Well, technologically a disaster? Yes. I would say a technological disaster because it was a technological disruption that created a whole new business environment. Challenges for us to look at. Uh, 2011 marked the most expensive year uh, in terms of disaster losses. I think that might have been exceeded by 2017. So we need to look at how we could update this slide. But then you look at the, the statistics and they talk about all these different types of losses from different, different things. You notice that Earthquakes and tsunamis uh, were kind of key, so we started to look at natural disasters. There's nowhere on this slide that talks about technology disasters. Nowhere on this slide that talks about the issue of risk from hackers, et cetera, et cetera. So my question when I looked at this slide and read it, when things go wrong, you must have a business continuity plan in place. I question that and say, but does having a plan in place guarantee success? So when we look at the guarantee of success, you have to comprehend that your plan is not necessarily going to be the end all to everything as with risk management. These are all constantly changing in terms of how we address them. By the, by the way, if you've been involved in a response to an incident and you've pulled your teams together for business continuity, crisis management, etc., have you ever seen anybody pull out a business impact assessment or a risk analysis and say, well, let's look at these things to see what, what, what we have here? No, they don't look at them. They run, if you will, almost by the seat of their pants. They react to the situation. In the same vein, having a plan in place. Having a plan doesn't guarantee success because most people don't open the plan when a crisis occurs. They basically operate in such a way that may adhere to elements of the plan, but unless they're fully vested in an understanding and have been trained, they're going to react the way they think things should go. And you can point out to them a numerous uh, situations where you can say, well, the plan says this, and you didn't do that. And they say, yeah, but the situation said this, and we had to do this. So we have to understand that, that the challenges here. Having a plan does not guarantee success. Having a risk management, a risk analysis, a risk management program does not guarantee you're going to get all the risks addressed. So let me turn it back over to Andrita and PECB, and we'll kind of close this out uh, with some discussion on their training programs, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for such a great presentation. It is a pleasure to have you as our presenter. In addition, I want to inform all the attendees that PECB provides training and certification services for ISO 31000, Introduction, Foundation, Risk Manager, and Lead Risk Manager. This training is designed to provide you with the required knowledge for implementing risk management processes throughout the organization using ISO 31000 standard as a reference framework. Now, we will go ahead and take some time to answer some more questions that we received during the session. The first question is, how do we manage to estimate operational risk likelihood occurrence? Well, I think that the, the estimation of likelihood of occurrence has got to be based on the exposure that, that you have and your ability to respond to it. So we'll go, I'll go back to, let me, if I can, I'll back up here on my slides to, uh, where's it at here? There. Uh, 
this issue of recognizing the risk and getting it to an altered state. I'll give you an example of, of uh, some lessons learned listening to people who trade commodities about dealing with risk issues and, and, and offsetting the risk aspect. The question came up one day with a colleague. Uh, they had a company they were they were working with in terms of their hedging of their commodities that they that they uh, produced. And the commodity produced was a biofuel. Now the company that produced the biofuel was located in Indianapolis, Indiana. They shipped the biofuels via railroad to California, where their contract was with uh, uh, an entity in California. Now, the, the entity in California and the, and the company in Indianapolis had a contract, and the contract essentially said that when you sell us the biofuel, we will pay you whatever the spot price is the day it arrives here at our facilities in California. So this sounds like a pretty good situation until you start to investigate and begin to look at the risks associated and the business continuity issues. So the question became very quickly, well, how long does it take to transport these tank cars full of biofuel to California? I've asked this question a number of times at conferences and whatnot. And I, I chuckle because people give me an answer anywhere from three to five days or, you know, 72 hours, something like that. So the, the, the reality is this, in terms of risk and in terms of continuity of your business. If you look at it in a simple simple term, you would say, okay, my my risk is that I make the biofuel and it costs me 50 cents to make. And it positively, if it gets out to California, it's 75 cents, so I make, I make money. If it's 35 cents, I lose money. The transportation issue is one that's critical. It takes 30 days to get out there. That's how the transportation network of rail systems work. Your transportation is not direct and uh, quickly, quickly done. It's it's something that takes time. Knowing that, we able we were able to look at developing financial hedges for that organization so that they could offset the risk of price fluctuation. Okay, next question. Thank you, Gary, for your answer. Next next question is. Analysis state that most companies go out of business due to poor or poorly executed strategies. Do you see BCP as a part of strategic planning as well? If yes, how? I see that BCP is an integral part of strategic planning because of the fact that you want to have your business continuity plan supportive of the strategic goals and objectives of the organization. Now, when we look at strategic goals and objectives, this is where risk management and business impact assessment become critical. You have to be able to look at all the potential threats to achieving those goals and objectives. And you have to have a plan in place for business continuity that allows you to deal with the disruptions that occur in the marketplace. So it's a, it's a way of helping strategists build better strategy. So, you know, when we look at, at this issue, you have a tremendous amount of optimism in organizations. And having dealt with startup organizations over the years, um, I've seen tremendous optimism as far as what they were going to be able to achieve. And then the realization was that, well, it sounded good and looked good on paper. The reality was that it didn't happen and they went out of business. I can tell you from a pocketbook standpoint, my own personal experience, I lost money on some of these organizations because I thought, okay, this looks good. Your plan's good. Everything else is good. What they, they hadn't done is assessed the ability to stay in business when disruption occurred. And as a result, they ended up going out of business. So it's business continuity, risk management, integral to strategic goals and objectives achievement. Thank you. The next question is, what is the difference between risks and incidents? Well, a risk is an incident that hasn't occurred. So I identify risks as a potential 
An incident is something that has actually happened. So when, again, look at my slide here, as I move to this altered risk state, there are potential situations that could occur where the risk becomes realized. Um, let's take the, the, uh, the situation with the pipeline that the, the Brits ran to the, from the North Sea into Scotland, uh, where they were delivering their, their crude oil and whatnot. Uh, who had thought about the business impact of an unexploded mine from, you know, quote, World War I or World War II, whenever, whenever uh, as a factor? No one thought about it. Yet when they were doing maintenance on the pipeline, suddenly this is discovered. Now we've got a potential business impact, which actually materialized, if you will, because they had to shut down the pipeline because they had to take the mine and remove it and destroy it. Now that was potentially a devastating situation that could have occurred, yet they got lucky. What would have happened is if they were doing the maintenance and they didn't see it and boom, Suddenly you've got a major oil spill, you've got all kinds of other things that potentially could happen. Uh, recently, there was an Iranian tanker that uh, exploded uh, and sank in the, I believe it was Sea of Japan. Uh, they, were carry, they were carrying crude oil uh, and unfortunately had a collision with another ship. Now you would think as big as the ocean is, ships would miss each other. But the reality is very simple they have collisions and they have them fairly frequently. Again, use the website I mentioned, G Captain. You will be amazed to see how many ships collide and how much you have as far as incidents that occur. All the differentiation between a risk and a reality. So an incident's a reality, a risk is a potential. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Next question is, have you tried using your BCP to create, drive a risk which was giving you a competitive advantage and actively take risks based on BCP strengths and capabilities? Yeah, I think that you, you have to begin to look at that issue in, in the context of, again, if you look at my slide here, there are positive consequences. So we have to rethink our thought process. Risk is not necessarily negative. Risk is potentially positive. And I could give you a number of examples of people who took risks and it eventually altered the entire uh, economic aspect of things. So if you look at, I guess, maybe the, uh, the great example, if you will, and it's, it's almost a scary example now because of the, the continuing development, Amazon started off selling books. They have evolved because they took risks into yesterday they announced that they opened a grocery store with no cashiers. So you can go in with your Amazon bag, buy your groceries, and never have to open your wallet. You, you are, everything's coded and it's all tracked and they've got cameras and all kinds of other stuff that is now changing that potential marketplace and causing their competition, other grocers, to perhaps rethink how they're looking at things. Now, the, the, the benefit was a positive risk because Amazon basically took the people that were in cashiers and other areas and they have reallocated them to other jobs. So they didn't, they didn't cause any disruption of, or loss of jobs. They basically expanded and then changed the face of things. So now you can go in, get your groceries, you can buy them online, go and pick them up. It, it change, it's changing the whole face of things. So positive consequences from potentially great risks. How will that evolve? Who knows? Uh, that that's kind of a kind of exciting when you think about it. Uh, okay, next question. Thank you, Gary. The next question is: Can we build a business continuity system even without a clear strategy in the organization? I would say you can build it. I don't know how well it would work. Um, and I say that that in this context, if your strategic goals and objectives are the focus of your organization, achieving those goals and objectives. If your business continuity plan does not 
enable, enable the achievement of those goals and objectives under disruptive situations, what value is it? So I need to have a plan that supports the goals and objectives. That I think is critical. Unfortunately, and I'll tell you this today, that most business continuity plans don't look at that issue of what are the strategic goals and objectives. And that's where there's a shortfall. That's where there's a shortfall with the ISO standards, the other regulatory standards, is they don't take into consideration what are the goals and objectives? How do we help them achieve these goals and objectives when there's a disruptive situation occurring? Um, and believe me, today's day and age, disruption is not just physical disruption. It is disruption in a, in a variety of ways. Look at the workforce issues. Uh, we, we talked about aging workforce. We talk about all these things coming to play. We've got a tremendous talent gap that's, gonna, that, that's occurring. Nuclear engineers, 57% of them due to retire. Uh, nobody's going to school to become a nuclear engineer because they'd rather go into other things. Petrochemical engineers, 80% worldwide due to retire in less than a few years. Big issue for the oil and gas and, and chemical industries because they can't replace those people. Engineering skills, if you will. So they're paying them huge salaries to coming, coming out of college as a petrochem engineer. Now, the, that, that, that issue, 80% are going to retire or potentially retire. What do you do? How do I overcome that? I can't automate everything because it's not going to work. An offshore oil platform needs people. They have to be doing some things. A chemical plant cannot be fully automated because you need to have people monitoring and making decisions. There's too many variables, if you will. So that becomes critical in our understanding of how plans need to support strategic goals and objectives. Okay, next question. Thank you, Gary. Due to the time limitation, I will read only one more question. Another question will be uh, answered individually uh, by email. The last question is, risk register is the responsibility of one department or it is maintained by every de department? I think, how would I put it? I think it's a responsibility of one department, but it has to be integrated into every department. Let me, I'll close in this way. I asked a question many, many years ago of people um, about business continuity. I think you could look at this question and I'll change the, the, the exact way I ask it. I, the original question, is business continuity a way of doing business for your organization or is it an adjunct to the business your organization does? So if I would re rephrase it, is business continuity and risk management a way of doing business within your organization or is it an adjunct? If business continuity and risk management are adjuncts to the way you do business, you'll never be effective in your planning and your programs. It has to be integrated as to how we do business. It has to be everybody's responsibility in the organization to begin to think about things differently, to think about how do we continue the business if something happens? What do we do about identifying risks that we haven't thought about? And, and that can come from the lowest levels in an organization through to upper management from a decision-making standpoint. Think about the people in your logistics area for looking at vendors and suppliers. They are probably better positioned to assess risks of the supply chain and what I'll call value chain than other others are in higher levels in the organization. So it's critical for us to understand these things because it's, it's one of those issues that we need to be able to address and integrate into the, our thought process for, for the business. Okay, so I'll, I'll conclude with that and then I, uh, Andrita, I'll let you talk about the, the, the last slide here. Thank you uh, once again, Gary, and I also want to thank all the attendees for joining us today. I want to inform you that this webinar is recorded and will be posted on our website and YouTube channel. 
Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey and we would really appreciate it if you could complete it and provide us with your feedback. Until the next webinar, thank you all and have a great day.